Well, thank you and welcome to this session. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're really thrilled to be here speaking with you about products that enrich lives. I think so often when we think about products and designing products, we think about things like the iPhone or fancy espresso makers. And actually, all products are designed, just more or less well designed. And so we're here to talk about products that are well-designed, but more importantly, products that are both well-designed and actually have a positive impact on people's lives. And so we have four designers of products joining us today, um, here to really share their experience about what it looks like to have a great product, what it looks like when a product doesn't work out so well, and why that is, what it really takes to bring a product to market, the uh, evolutions and iterations involved in really getting a product refined and out there in the hands of people, and how we design not just products, but really the systems around them, how we think about marketing and communications and distribution channels and business models and customer experiences and service models um, to really ensure that the product is both initially adopted but then used and continued to be used uh, by people over time so that it does continue to serve that life of, of enriching people's lives. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists. We have Krista Donaldson on my right, who's the CEO of DREV. We have Mishkin Ingavale, who's the founder of Biosense Technologies. Catherine Moore, who's the Senior Director of Medical Research of Intuitive, at Intuitive Surgical, which works uh, with surgical robots. And Kurt Newman, the President and CEO of Children's National Medical Center. So I'm going to ask each of them to just spend a couple minutes introducing themselves a little bit more, but more importantly, to talk about how the work that they do relates to products that enrich lives. So you Should can start? start, Krista. Okay. Um, as Jocelyn mentioned, I'm Krista. Uh, DREV is short for Design Revolution, and our sole mission, we're structured as a nonprofit, and we want to improve the lives of people living on less than $4 a day. We originally started doing general product development. We looked at how can you pasteurize milk very cheaply on the farm and rural East Africa, but we very quickly started to focus on medical devices. And I, this is probably the right audience that I don't need to convince you, there's so many opportunities. And when I say we're focused on people living on less than $4 a day, we're really looking at low income countries. Um, we have two strands of product development. One is neonatal health, and our big focus there is India, where 20% of all live births in the world are, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, our second strand is mobility, and I have some knees here that we can talk about in a little bit. One of them is our knee, um, but a prosthetic knee for above knee amputees. And in low-income countries, does anyone want to guess the major cause of amputation? I see a few nods. Parasites. Pardon? Parasites. Parasites? I haven't heard that one, but it's probably... They're related, yes. In the back? Diabetes, Diabetes is one. I think that's now number three in the world. That's number two, that's the usual one. But the, actually the biggest cause, I'm not gonna make you keep guessing, is um, road accidents. So those of you who have spent a lot of time in low income places, you see mopeds whipping in and out, you see cars overcrowded, you see people walking by the road at night, the roads slope off, you, you, you're with me. Um, but our, that's really where our focus is and our product development is around that. Great, thanks. So uh, my name is Mishkin. Uh, I co-founded in 2008 a company called Biosense. Uh, it was essentially uh, sort of started off as a little project which uh, me and a group of three doctors were doing. So I'm an engineer. I used to be an engineer. Now I'm an evil marketing type. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, it was a project around how to solve the big problem of uh, anemia. So for maternal and child health, uh, an anemia is really a big and, in my opinion, needless uh, killer in India and many other parts of the world. So we developed a non-invasive hemoglobin estimation device, a small hand, sort of handheld device. Later on, as, as we went on, we realized that a lot of uh, processing analysis of data which we generate could actually be done using mobile devices. Uh, and again, mo most of you will know in the developing world, uh, Android devices are really, uh, you know, uh, you can get an Android device for like $80. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we currently have a range of products which use the power of Android and use, for example, UCheck, one of the products which we have, uh, uses a simple imaging system. So the camera of the uh, of an Android-like device is used uh, to image urine and blood test strips. 
So a diagnosis of up to like 25 different medical conditions is possible with this data. When uh, these kind of devices are in the hands of uh, health workers, uh, even pathologists who operate uh, smaller labs in uh, outside major cities. So uh, it, it's a completely for-profit venture. We, we work with both designers, engineers in our own team. We work with researchers in universities. Uh, and we work with salespeople and distributors and all those unpredictable characters. <laughs> Um, I'm Catherine Moore. I'm a senior director of medical research at Intuitive Surgical, and we make the Da Vinci Surgical Robot. And I also started as an engineer. I worked as an engineer for about nine years in high-altitude aircraft and electric cars, and then went to medical school in my 30s, trained in surgery, and now I work at the intersection of bringing medicine and technology together so that we can figure out how to improve patient outcomes. And the, the main product of Intuitive Surgical is the Da Vinci Surgical Robot. And it's designed to take surgeries that would otherwise be done through an open incision and allow them to be done through a very small uh, set of small incisions on the body. So being able to take surgeries that are ordinarily open and make them minimally invasive. A lot of the work that I do on this system is primarily associated with improving clinical decision making. How do we allow the surgeon to better identify where the nerves and the vessels and the cancer are? Where, where can we use fluorescence imaging or can we use navigation to allow the surgeon to get to different places in the body and make it easier for them to get a good clinical outcome for that patient? And my name is uh, Kurt Newman. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm president and CEO of uh, Children's National Medical Center uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, but in full disclosure, um, I was a surgeon for most of my career and three years ago became uh, CEO of what's now uh, a pediatric health system. Uh, and my goal uh, as CEO of that uh, health system for kids is to use our health system to, to innovate, to be creative. Children are frequently not thought about when it comes to innovation and devices. So we want to use our health system, the doctors and nurses, uh, the patients and families in that uh, to identify uh, uh, areas where we can make improvements. And that may be, and, and use some of the technologies that you've uh, heard here. And it may not just be devices, but it may be things like um, apps, uh, apps for concussion management, for example. Or it might be using gaming technology as a mode of engaging kids in, in pain uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, what we've really been trying to do with our, our health system for kids is uh, create a culture of innovation so that nurses or physical therapists or pharmacists, uh, wherever they are in the system, as they identify problems, uh, we can bring together the resources that are, are uh, required to begin thinking through solutions uh, for, those, for those kids and those families and then work with others and other partners to see if there's wider applications for those ideas. Thanks. So I ask you each to um, think about a product that you believe has enriched lives, maybe outside of your own organizations. And so I wanted each of you to share those with the group just so we can get a better sense of some more examples of where we're seeing products really have positive impact. So Krista, do you want You're to start? You're looking at me to start. Yeah. Um, I'm actually gonna go totally outside of medical devices. Um, as a designer, and I'm totally with Jocelyn and IDEO about being very user-centric or human-centric, and I'm going to say TED is a really great example of enriching lives. And this is the reason, is there's, there was a, there's a real desire for people to have more knowledge. They're leveraging technology that enables people to see things in the farthest reaches of the world. They're empowering them by having local TED events and having TED in a box. And so I think to me, like, what can we learn? Even though we're in a totally different field, we're designing physical hardware, what can we learn about the success, and not only the success they've had, but how they keep learning and how they keep wanting to do better by understanding their users? Can I do two? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get one for free. So my first one is, well, you mentioned TED. So uh, I think you were a TED fellow. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> if, if uh, people here have seen the Hans Rosling's talk on uh, washing machines. Mm -hmm. So the semi-automatic washing machine yeah. is, in my opinion, the single greatest invention. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> a washing machine. Just, uh, just the simplest possible washing machine you can think of, uh, which just does the job. You know, switch it on, out comes clean clothes. Uh, in <laughs> the, the reason, of course, is uh, 
to do with women's rights and how this has liberated women in many parts of the world from the drudgery of uh, you know, washing clothes, wasting so much time. Uh, the second one, linked to health but not a healthcare innovation at all, is uh, Unilever's innovation of uh, selling uh, soap and shampoo in one rupee sachets. So one rupee is, uh, I don't know, uh, one cent, two cents. It's a very small amount. So one rupee uh, sachets, so that even the poorest of the poor who don't have a stable cash flow situation can still afford to uh, take care of sanitation and essentially st preventive health kind of thing. Um, I'm, I'm going to stay in the world of robotics, but work in a, in a sort of a different end. And it has to do with companion robotics. One of the things that I think we all want for ourselves is the ability to age in place and age with dignity and not end up in a nursing home earlier than we really do need to be there. And there's a lot of people that are working in the area of robotics that could be around the home where they kind of pick up the things that get dropped on the floor so that they're not a trip risk, that talk to you. And if you're sort of slurring your words or you're not responding quite correctly, call up one of your kids or another caregiver and, and says, you know, there's some red flags going on here. Robots that will monitor medication intake and say, you know, either to remind you to take them or to uh, flag somebody when you're not taking medication, or, and also to do monitor, monitoring of some vital signs. We've seen people putting sensors into flats where your blood pressure can be monitored and other, you can get a retinal scan, but not quite yet in some of these installations. But just the sort of the general being monitored there so that the kinds of things that tend to send people into nursing homes, medication noncompliance, uh, kids being worried about them starting to get, conf parents starting to get confused, uh, trip hazards, all of these sorts of things are really minimized and it really extends the amount of time that people can live independently. So I'm excited about some of those things. Great. Okay. Uh, well, the, the one I'd choose outside uh, would um, perhaps be, uh, th I wish I thought of 3D printing. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, we, um, uh, have a 3D printer that we've just started using to see all the uh, different possibilities. And when you see uh, uh, the physicians, and some of this is around simulation and, and just uh, thinking around, uh, uh, for example, in surgery, um, how to look at a baby's heart and uh, the heart surgery, and you can print out the heart and all the different uh, changes. You see the uh, uh, just the horizons that are uh, in front of us uh, in terms of uh, printing new organs or tissues or uh, and then uh, bringing genetics uh, into that uh, tissue engineering. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's just uh, there's just this tremendous uh, technology that's, that's coming along that is going to really transform uh, a lot of the um, issues that we currently face. Great, thanks. Catherine, can you talk a little bit about designing? Um, we were talking earlier about um, the, the fact that when we talk about patient-centric design, it sort of assumes that the patient is actually the one interacting with this technology. And so often, that's not actually the case. And so that's why we talk about human-centered design, because it is a much more holistic approach in terms of thinking about designing for various stakeholders in the system. But can you share um, the story that you are sharing earlier about, yeah. about that? Uh, we've got a particularly complex set of customers for something like a surgical robot. The, the patient wants a minimally invasive surgery, but the patient interacts with this product when they're anesthetized and on a table. They're not actually, you know, it, it, it's a quality interaction, but not one that they're conscious for. Whereas, hopefully, hopefully yes. <laughs> we'll have to have words with anesthesia if that's the case. But um, so then you'd say, well, then who is the primary customer for this? In a lot of ways, it's the surgeon that's using the robot because through them, they're the one that's actually interacting with it but they're not the one that's purchasing it. It's the hospital or the healthcare system that is purchasing it. And so they're in some ways the customer. Outside the United States, it's the larger 
healthcare system for the entire country that is having to make a decision on whether moving open surgeries to minimally invasive surgeries using this technology is cost effective and a good bet for them. And so now you're talking to large global healthcare systems. And so the, the customer is, a, is sort of a moving target depending on what you're thinking about. And I think in a lot of medical products, that's very similar in that there's the whole system that provides that product or the ecosystem that's around it. The other thing we talked about a bit was in the early incarnation of the product, of the robot, it was designed for the surgeon. But the people who were interacting with it the most were the OR staff. And they really didn't like the first generation of the robot. It was clunky, it was difficult to set up, it was, you know, there was a lot of issues with it. And later generations didn't really change the experience for the surgeon very much, but really changed the experience for the OR staff. So yeah, it was understanding who the customer and who you're designing for and, and who is that user-centric, who is that user for which you are doing user-centric design. And if you want to play with it, it's over in the Sinai tent. You can go and play around with it and play surgeon for a day if you'd like to. Yeah. <laughs> Michigan, can you talk about who you think about designing for? This is, this is a great uh, topic because, uh, uh, I mean, similar example I can sort of uh, narrate here. Initially, when we thought of mobile phones and medicine or diagnostics, we were thinking of actual mobile phones, the one which we have in our pockets. We were thinking of us, users. Mm -hmm me sitting in an air-conditioned lab in Boston. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's not the case. We realized that initially, so maybe a real story of how we made, made 32 mistakes as I did. So uh, the mistake was that I designed for myself. Mm -hmm. So I designed as if I'm a consumer, I'm actually looking at my blood testing and urine data and taking decisions. But very soon I realized that without my mom's help, my mom is a pediatrician, without my mom's help, I knew nothing about what was going on. I actually needed a doctor. I needed somebody to tell me. Uh, and so therefore, this product which we had released enthusiastically, targeted at consumers, failed. Uh, because we really had not addressed the right issue. We had the right data, it was accurate, reliable, all, all our comparative studies, everything was fine. But it was a not, not a successful product commercially. We had not identified the right users. Then in India, as we were trying to figure out who would be the consumer, uh, who would be the user, the purchaser, we realized that, is it the doctor we asked ourselves? Is it the doctor who is going to buy this or use this? And we realized, no, that's not the case. The doctor is not going to use this, buy this. He's not the big supporter of this. The real user we found was uh, the, the, the staff in the healthcare center, the person who actually uh, does the test. So, and everything changed after that. So from a design perspective, let's take again the example of a phone. A phone is better if it's smaller and thinner. That's what all advertising tells us, and we believe it somehow, right? The thinner, smaller, uh, air whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, this metaphor did not quite cross over. In a clinic, the healthcare staff was overburdened. They had like, in India, hundreds of patients just coming in and out and everything was chaotic. Uh, there was, they didn't have a moment to spare. For them, they actually asked us to make our device, which is not just a phone, it's a full device around the phone, bigger and heavier so that it could not be carried away, not stolen. <laughs> So, so my design team, who had very aesthetically designed the first version to be nice and rounded edges and beautiful to look at and thin and slim and easy to carry, redesigned it to be big, clunky. <laughs> it had a, almost a, it had a hole for a padlock so it could be locked to the table. <laughs> and that worked, so it's doing very well across. <laughs> Krista, can you talk about DREV's design process? What does it really look like to go through a human-centered design approach when you design one of these products? It takes a long time. And actually, I love that we're starting with talking about the various stakeholders, if you're going to use development jargon. Um, one of the things we've really learned, and we spend a lot of time on the front end of product development, really digging in and understanding who all those users are. And they, as you can imagine, don't always agree in what they want in a product. So one of our challenges as a designer is saying, oh, in our case, you have parents who want something that doesn't look very threatening if their baby's being treated by it. You want a nurse who can operate the device with one hand because she's holding other things. And you want a doctor and you want, per you know, everybody's got their different needs. And you have to figure out how to balance it out. But I like that we're having this discussion because when you're in the early stage of product development, you really have to understand the entire system. And this goes into maintenance. I think we spend a lot of time 
thinking about the design of the thing, right? Like the product. But that product fits into an overall system. And I think particularly in global health, there's this tension between change people's behavior to like use this better thing, right? Um, the approach we take at DREV is like, no, well, what are they doing now? What, what are our users doing now? But what do they want? And all of our products so far have been driven by users saying, we really need this thing. And the great thing is if you're designing for your users, you're not trying to change their behavior. You're giving them something or you're enabling them to have a tool that they want and they see the value in right away. So a kind of to answer Jocelyn's question, our, the overview of our design process, I'm going to make it sound really neat. And those of you who are designers are going to be like, yeah, yeah, it's a lot messier than this. And it is. But we start with like this design phase, understanding the landscape, understanding the price point, who the competitors are. Um, are there spare parts? For example, we designed a phototherapy device with LEDs. Those of you who know and love LEDs know they last a really, really long time. In India, most phototherapy devices use two bulbs. Those cost a lot of money, but fundamentally, they're really hard to get. You need to understand that about your product. Another thing, because we work in low-income areas, we see a lot of voltage surges. How does your product handle that? That's part of the system, right? And then we design the product, and that's kind of like, and a lot of this is happening in parallel. We'll do rapid prototypes, but design is what you think of, like brainstorming, prototyping, getting a lot of user feedback, refining the embodiment or the product. Um, and then we think about delivery as manufacturing, distribution, sales, marketing, regulatory, registration. Um, one of the lessons we're learning right now at DREV is as you enter new countries, Every country is totally inconsistent with regulatory, registration, tariffs, um, protectionism. And um, we naively thought, oh, you know, a great product will just scale. No. <laughs> um, and then moving into, like, if you're working on big problems, which we try and do, if it works in one market, for example, if it does work in India, um, how do you scale it into sub-Saharan sub African countries? Um, and how can you adapt things? Or do you really have to kind of move backwards in the design process and redesign for local and cultural and social and economic constraints. So for example, Kenya is a great, is an interesting example. If you have a market-driven model, it's very heavily aid-driven, but you have this burgeoning, amazing private sector that's coming up. And understanding those dynamics, you need to understand that. And ideally, you're, you're understanding that in the early stage so that you can design for that. And then as a nonprofit, we also want to measure our impact. So I say it's messy because ideally, when you're in the design process of designing a thing, you want to be thinking about how am I going to measure impact, and maybe you can design that into the device. And that's, for example, one of our goals. Great. At IDEO and IDEO.org, we talk a lot about designing for extreme users, meaning um, one example of this is work IDEO did years ago to design the Xylus uh, kitchen utensils. And so instead of talking with um, middle-aged moms um, in Chicago, they actually did interviews with and prototyped products with professional chefs and people with extreme arthritis and three-year-old children. And that by designing a set of kitchen utensils to meet the needs of all of those people, that you're going to design a great set of utensils that meet the needs of everyone in between. And so Kurt was talking about this a bit in terms of his work um, doing design work and designing um, for children in particular. So can you talk about a little bit about the considerations related to that? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so. Uh, uh, most uh, uh, design and uh, around devices and technology, uh, adults have been the focus just in, in this country because that's where the markets are and that's kind of, despite all the, the great uh, sort of planning and things, when you really start looking at commercializing something, it's driven by um, where the market is and, and, and uh, whether it'll be commercially successful. With children, that's almost never going to be the case because they're uh, uh, just a small part of the market. So we took an approach and said, well, maybe we can turn this around. Let's look at what are the biggest issues our nurses face, our kids face, our families face. And the issue that kept popping up was pain, pain management. And why is that? Because kids and babies uh, and, and, and small children uh, can't really tell you whether they're in pain or not. Uh, we have scores and different things, very subjective. But there's no objective measurement of pain. So the idea was that uh, uh, we came up with was to try and develop a, uh, an objective measurement of pain based on some technology. And the, the cool thing about it was you start learning lots of things that are uh, maybe counterintuitive that, uh, around the way babies may experience pain or the way the medications that are being given uh, uh, produce effects. So that's a long uh, uh, story to say that uh, once you start defining it in children or in babies, then you realize that the obje objective measurement of pain actually has a huge, tremendous market uh, uh, for adults because there are a lot of adults that can't really tell you whether they're in pain or not or, they, uh, and, or uh, 
uh, and you can't, it's hard to do research because you don't have the object, objective uh, measurement. Another spinoff was that, was that uh, uh, some of our uh, young doctors said, well, you know what, the way these kids are coming to us to be evaluated for pain, they've already been to four or five doctors, they've been poked and prodded, uh, they don't want to see another doctor, they don't want to uh, talk at all, they don't want to have any kind of an experience with the medical system. Well, why don't we just change up uh, the medical system to be in a game and create uh, the whole uh, principle of the interaction around gaming technology. So the idea was to, uh, 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 when they're being uh, checked out by a doctor, they're actually playing a game. Or when they're doing their physical therapy, they're playing a game. All of these things are being measured uh, and analyzed and uh, can be uh, put into the medical record, but it completely changes the experience for uh, kids in pain, autism, uh, you name it. So if you really, um, I think, getting back to the uh, uh, great points that you made was when you really study what's going on and not just go in to create a device or create something, but you really, and I think all these stories are wonderful examples, you start seeing what that there's lots of different pieces that go into it, and out of that, a lot of wonderful innovation happens. Great, thanks. So I think it's an important point that, that products that we design are both physical products, but also can be digital tools or products as well. So technology is something that we can de design as our systems and programs and communications. Um, so really applying design in sort of the broadest sense. So, Michigan, can you talk a bit about, you have obviously product design experience, but have also been doing some hackathons. Yeah. Can you talk about what the design process looks like when you're designing digital tools as well? Uh, yeah, sure. So, the context to that is, uh, uh, so this mobile plus health intersection, uh, there's a whole, whole new world, you know, it's like hundreds of ideas possible, some simple, some complicated, and no individual or even one team cannot really tackle them all, right? So uh, the, the concept, and it started at MIT, so Ramesh Raskar, uh, who, who's done like, fantastic stuff there, he took the whole hackathon culture to India in medical devices, so health tech, you know, some mobile plus some gadget to measure intraocular distance, or a, a small add-on to a phone to diagnose your number, yeah, get your number. So these kind of gadgets started coming up, and now you have... 15-year-old kids, so a person I know, for example, Angad Daryani, he's 14 or 15. Um, he's developed like two or three of these, so this is all coming up. Uh, and in the hackathon format, one great thing I think Ramesh has hit upon has been that uh, you set up essentially the hackathon inside a hospital. So one of the, I think the ones which uh, I, I was very impressed by was one which was done in a LV Prasad Eye Hospital in Hyderabad, where uh, each, uh, a surgeon was, you know, given like five big problems, or not given, they knew their problems, I guess. Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, and uh, they were arbitrarily assigned teams of designers and mechanical engineers and software guys to just come and uh, pester them for like one day. Uh, so, and then uh, Ramesh essentially told these guys that, uh, the teams, that you have seven days to come up with a working prototype. If you do that, I'll introduce you to Ratan Tata. Yeah, I mean, he's the... If the big uh, industrialist in India. So, uh, and this kind of format works, where you're given a time pressure, you're given big problem, you're given a domain expert, and you're just told to figure it out. There was no, uh, no professor, there was no uh, money, there was no, I mean, uh, uh, there, there were a few duct tape, essentially, right? <laughs> 3D printers and uh, a few odds and ends lying around. And you, you had to improvise, you had to work under that constraint, and you had to make do with what you had in your team. So that's sort of, we, we pull a lot of methodology from Lean Startup, and that's sort of the minimum yeah, viable <laughs> product approach to um, product development. Catherine, can you talk about on the other extreme, what does it take to get something um, through the approval process? So what, does the, what did the design process um, for the robot look like for you, and how, how long a time frame did that take to get it into market? Well, so, so that we have a, a new product that came out which was aimed at uh, general surgery, being able to do multi-quadrant surgery. It came out after about five years of development and regulatory approval and testing. So you're talking design cycles that aren't 
the day and the hackathon, <laughs> yeah. but when, when you're in the sort of the high stakes medical space, being able to design for getting it through regulatory, being able to design for the long-term maintenance, being able to uh, test the safety of it. Uh, this is where you're looking at design teams that are in the hundreds and uh, are working for uh, four to five years to solve the same problem. So and what does that regulatory process look like? Can you describe that a bit? Uh, so it's different in different parts of the world. So the FDA process here is you bring a device in and you are asking for approval in a particular indication. So you're saying, I have this device, it is useful for this type of surgery. Uh, you know, prostatectomy was one of the, the first big applications of this. And let me show you that it is safe in this area and let me show you the comparisons to it, the predicate devices, that I can say it works essentially like this and so therefore we believe it's going to be safe in the population. In Europe, it's a, a very much device specific safety evaluation. And so it, it's recommended for certain purposes, but they look at the device itself and the safety associated with the device. And then you get a CE mark on that. And it's much more up to the medical industry or the, the, the surgeons, how they're going to use it. Um, it. It's not completely carte blanche, but it is, it's much more so where it's focused on the device in Europe and focused on the applications in the US. And Outside of that, um, in Japan, <laughs> it's focused on you have to redo all of your studies, every single one of them with uh, Japanese patients in order to get approval in Japan because in Japan, that's how you do it. <laughs> and, uh, and, but then there's also lots of other countries are either doing the CE approach or something similar to the FDA, but they tend to look towards those two big bodies. I would add one yeah. thing is, um, and we're in like the total opposite end of, yeah. of what Catherine does. And some of the markets we enter don't have any regulatory controls at all, which is both um, scary, I think, on the patient side, but also great if you're on the high quality medical device side. So, for example, with phototherapy, um, our device, the reg India actually does not regulate it. Um, so it is very easy for a small startup like us. Um, it took us about three years to get it to market, and we were about a team of four people. Um, but we can enter that market very quickly. Um, and because there is distrust, um, because there isn't a regulatory system, they do require CE mark. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did is we filed for CE mark, and we designed that knowing that we could still enter the Indian market without it. Is that the same for you? Yeah, so uh, ISO 13485 is a standard. If you have uh, good manufacturing practices followed, I think uh, in general they're a good, good, good deal anyway, right? I mean, good uh, practice anyway. So if you have them, it's good. It's not the re there is no medical device regulator. But what typically happens is that large institutional customers would anyway, like you said, demand CE, yeah. the European standard. That's yeah. what happens. By the way, just uh, the digital part, which yeah. you I was just thinking about it. What I've realized is that probably in all of our products, digital is used. The the digital layer plays different roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the safety yeah. issue which you mentioned, the, we were having an earlier discussion. So the safety issue in our device is that the digital, uh, ha there's like a lot of algorithms to make sure that uh, there, are, there are no errors in the reading. So the hardware itself is supplemented by a lot of interesting sort of smarts which are built into the digital layer. Mm. And it can do all kinds of stuff. So I was just thinking your, your question around how to design around digital is that you can model business processes much you know, quickly, quickly, swiftly, once you understand what's, what it's all about. So in our case, I was mentioning that uh, the staff is the user, yeah. but the purchaser is, of course, not the staff. Right. The purchaser is the, maybe the uh, person who sits in head office in Bombay or Delhi or somewhere. So for that person, if, I don't know if I have time, maybe a small thing, story, sure. or yeah. the digital piece. Yeah, yeah, so we could offer a d additional service using digital. The, sta the, the, the management layer, they were concerned of course, with safety and giving output to patient, but they were also concerned about cheating, that their own staff don't do the test at all. They just fudge the data, that we have done the test and they are paid as an incentive. So we could offer via digital layer a, se a secure way of confirming that these are the tests which have been done at this location, geotagged, timestamped mm. across India for that organization, this kind of stuff. And of course, if there is some staff somewhere who is cheating the system, hacking into our system and doing this, then please join us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
if we have programmer and developer roles open. You know, I think the, uh, uh, there's some interesting uh, uh, threads here. The, the, the digital applications and, and the limitations of access to care uh, create uh, tremendous opportunities. And when you um, uh, link it to hackathons or uh, prizes or competition or open source and getting people involved, uh, wonderfully creative things happen. And a couple of e examples uh, we've had um, is linking uh, 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 photography with some algorithms that can look at uh, genetic uh, uh, dysmorphology. So uh, children with genetic uh, uh, issues uh, may, in, in their, just their facial morphology, you can diagnose about 97% uh, of those. So you can just imagine in, in countries where there's uh, uh, genetic issues but not geneticists, uh, the uh, caregiver uh, taking uh, photographs and then having the early diagnosis, which leads to early intervention in many cases uh, and, uh, and better outcomes. So it's uh, uh, low cost and it, uh, uh, we've got uh, something we're working on right now uh, with that. Another issue right here in this country is the epidemic of uh, uh, concussion and head injury. There's not enough athletic uh, trainers, coaches, uh, uh, people that can be on the sidelines when a, a, a child in particular is, is injured or has a head injury. So one of our uh, concussion specialists, a neuropsychologist, designed an app, uh, and the user was not uh, the doctor, but it was really the parent. Mm -hmm. So that any parent could have this loaded on their, uh, uh, on their smartphone, and if, or the coach or, or the kids, and uh, uh, do the concussion uh, test right there on the sideline and whether they uh, can go back to play or not or whether they need to sit out. And so those kinds of things are just going to revolutionize, I think, uh, uh, access to care. So that the, uh, and, and I think we're going to see much, much more of that as uh, the next few years. Yeah, but in the meantime, they're going to give the FDA conniptions because <laughs> yeah. how do you, how do you, what is it? What is this app? Is it a device? Is it a drug? They, they is it a diagnostic? The guidelines recently, but they're still, they're a long still way to struggling go. with it. Yeah. You know, the, the whole thing with 23andMe, the whole thing with these. these well, Margaret Hamburg is here tonight, so yeah. I, I, I <laughs> yeah. suggest you answer the question. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's difficult, and defining what they are and what they do, and, and who should be responsible for the, the safety of it. And, and what happens if it does a misdiagnosis? But the market and, forces are going to uh, oh, they're, uh, push I'm, it. I'm totally for them. I'm just, I'm <laughs> I'm just at, at this point um, in the unusual position of feeling somewhat sorry for the FDA <laughs> in terms of. <laughs> that is unusual for you. <laughs> in, in their having to figure out how they're going to regulate this. I want to I go back to our topic, which is enriching people's lives through products. And I think we, we give a lot of lip service to that, and we talk about how products can enrich. But I think a call to action that we can all do is to be very clear about how our products are enriching lives and having very clear goals about what that enrichment is. Are you diverting death and disability? Are you enabling people to live a more full life? And then you need to have metrics on how to measure it and go back and measure it. Because I think at the end of the day with product development, all the work we do, it's not just determining if you're hitting that goal, you're, you're folding lessons back into the product development process. And we're, we're talking about these products, you know, as these things that you develop, but like, for example, with our phototherapy device, it's, we've gone through multiple iterations. We put one on the market and we're going to be launching another one soon, but it's from direct feedback from users about what worked and what didn't. And I got thinking about this with the whole digital thing, because with our phototherapy device, um, there were some really interesting findings around digital. One was that um, all of our doctors wanted to know how long the light had been on to be treating the baby. So think about light as dosing. Um, but they also wanted to know how long the machine has been on total. And this, you didn't need this with LEDs. This is a holdover from having two bulbs and you needed to know how often you needed to replace them. But they still liked it. We liked it because if we know how long the machine's on, we can estimate how many babies are treated. And if we estimate how many babies are treated, we can get at this impact number. And so if we go into a hospital and we see these numbers are really low, then that, that pushes us to say, why aren't you using this? And don't feel badly telling us you don't like it because we as designers and engineers need to learn how to make better products that do change people's lives and do reach those goals as compared to just kind of talking about it. And so I would say like in all of our lives and the work we're doing, if we can be very clear about that and hold ourselves accountable. Can you um, show us the name? It has enriched my life. So yeah. sure. my uh, yeah. child had a neonatal jaundice. Yeah. So I know do you that. Have a brilliant spelling not. <laughs> 
can you can you show us sure. that how that iteration has worked on the knee? Because I think it's yeah. helpful. So this is um, a prosthetic knee for above knee amputees, and this is um, the state of the heart. Uh, the state of the heart. State of the art for quote poor people. Um, this is a Red Cross knee, so the International Committee for the Red Cross. I'm going to unlock it, but you can see it's a single axis knee. So single axis, just think of like a door hinge, okay? Um, we have videos on our website, but if you see someone walking on this knee, it's very unstable, because think of your center of gravity going over that axis, you're going to lose stability. Um, and our project started when the Jaipur Foot Clinic in India, and they're the largest fitter of amputees um, living in poor areas, particularly India, came to a Stanford class and said, we need a better knee. We need something that operates more like, you know, greater functionality, greater stability. This is what the students designed. This is called the Jiper knee. Um, and it's now in use um, by over 6,000 amputees. And it uses a polycentric mechanism. So this mechanism has been around since like the 70s. But what the students did is they said, OK, how do we make this really affordably and high quality? Um, DREV, we absorb those students eventually because oftentimes you have these student classes, they do this incredible work. Not all of them, but you know, a few of them do. And then where do they go when the class is over? So we absorb them and now we're on the third version of the knee. And I don't want to make it sound like it was really easy going from version one to version three. Um, we have a version two in the middle where we had learned, we had gotten user feedback, we put a noise dampener in. I'll, let, I'll, let you, I'll actually pass this around. You can make it click. So if you're walking around, you don't want to be clicking. So there's a noise dampener in here. You can see we made it smoother. But we probably have like over 150 design files between that version and this version, just to give you a sense of the iterations that go into it. And, and how long did that take? Three years, or three or four years actually. And we just um, finished field trials where I can tell you we had some major problems in the beginning, but um, we figured those out and got it going. So this is the third version. And um, some improvements on this that we learned from the field trial will be released later this year. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we find so often is that when people have not had experience as product designers, they think that to get to this is, you know, two to three months of work and $100,000. And I think just to sort of put it out there, I know we've all been saying this, but it's oftentimes millions of dollars and years of work um, to get to something that looks really simple and really basic, but actually to get to the simplest, most effective, least expensive option is much harder than it is to get to something that's much more expensive with more feature sets. And let me, let me add one more thing. Is That's designing the product. You still have to get the products to users. And if you're looking, in our case, at low-income users, you have to get the products to the right users, right? So if our medical devices just go to the high-end hospitals in India and other places, we haven't done our job. It's got to get to the right users, and then it has to work and be used properly. So all of that, to us, goes in the design process of those little things going around. Yeah, the design for sales part is not typically taught. Yeah. It's, sales yeah. is like this bad word, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you for asking. So this costs about $150 if you're gonna buy a Red Cross knee. Ours is $80 for a polycentric knee that looks like that you're gonna really pay a minimum of $1,400. And those, the quality isn't very good. So for something like this that's higher quality, it's really around $6,000. And that's where really where we see our sweet spot is very high quality but very affordable. And designing for the beginning from that. So let's um, turn it over to you guys for questions. There's a microphone back there. Um, because this session is being recorded, I'm just going to ask you to step up to the microphone to ask your question. And so we can get through a number of questions. Just ask you to keep it short and actually ask a question, please. <laughs> So yeah, you can just go ahead um, and line up behind the microphone. Oh, there's one. There's, there's a one roving, roving microphone, microphone right there. Okay. Cool. So yeah, either stand behind that one or you can wait for the roving one. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Yes. Yeah. So um, I know you guys are talking about specific products and um, uh, ideas and stuff like that. So how do you go about prioritizing the issues that you are working for in, in designing particular solutions? But how do you go about prioritizing the issues that are important to you? or in terms of um, creating impact to the entire world. Krista, do you want to take that? Sure, I'll tackle that because um, there are, as you know, just countless problems we could be working on. Um, we were a little bit, I'm very pragmatic at the end of the day. I spent most of my professional life living in places where nothing worked. <laughs> so um, my approach has been like, okay, let's start simply, let's start easily. And at DREV, we had a very small team and we started three people. We were really looking for low hanging fruit and the phototherapy device Brilliance was our first one. And at the end of the day, it's just a really nice blue lamp. 
Um, yes, it has to meet certain regulatory requirements, but we were not going to tackle asphyxia or sepsis, kind of these big ticket items in global health right away. And we were looking for where users were saying no one's really working on this. So it was a combination of like, what resources do we have? What are users asking for? And what do we think we can do? And even now, groups will come to us and they have really solid needs, but we're not the right people to do it because pragmatically, we don't have the skills or we don't have the partners. And that's the other thing I want to be really clear about. We're not figuring this out with three people. We're very heavily reliant on an excellent network of partners and advisors. So that's our approach, at least. Okay, that's right. Uh, interesting question. Uh, I actually literally have a, like a Venn diagram. You know, people uh, in my team have fun on certain kinds of projects. That's one circle. High impact projects, another circle. And a really important circle, what will sell. You know, so the intersection is probably a great place to start, very simply. <laughs> and I don't think it, it, it ends there either. Once you've prioritized and start working, I think you have to have a process also when to, when to stop. When something, when you've gone a little, you put too much into it, and maybe you've got some other things that are uh, working better, and so you can. Uh, uh, so it, you need to really stage gate these things and make sure that. I think uh, you, you've got to be disciplined about looking at uh, the metrics and and uh, and how it's going, and are people delivering on uh, what they uh, thought they could do, and then uh, have the courage to say, you know what, we've gone a little too far with this, but we got two other things that are really. Uh, uh, going to have a lot more impact and more promise. Yeah, and, and I think with courage also comes a little bit of trust. You have to trust that there are other brilliant people out there trying to save other parts of the world, and it's okay to focus in one area, that you don't have to save everything, and that, and that solving problems that are worth solving means that there will be other people out there working on some of the other problems worth solving. Now, I'm not terribly disciplined about this myself. I mean, within, in my work environment, our mission is to bring minimally invasive surgery to the largest number of people, to close that gap between what we want to do for the patients and what we can do for the patients. In my personal life, I'm working with the Global Alliance on Vaccines to look at peer-to-peer -peer networks on how we can improve vaccine delivery in the last mile. And I'm working with our local food banks on data-driven systems on how we can uh, decrease the friction in terms of getting restaurant excess food and gleaned fruit from backyards and uh, mom and pop grocery store surplus into agencies that are delivering the food out, you know, and are working with local food banks, but bringing data in order to be able to allow that sort of thing. And so I'm trying to work on too many problems <laughs> all at once, but you know, you pick the important ones and, and throw yourself into it passionately. Your questions, yeah. Uh, mostly directed to Catherine, Intuitive Surgicals developed a wonderful product with Da Vinci, but about well, six or eight months ago, the press came up and said, well, it's much more uh, expensive to have a Da Vinci surgical uh, uh, operation versus open surgery, and the outcomes weren't proven to be a lot better. And it, you know, all of a sudden there was a lot of discussion about all this new technology and the cost to the healthcare system. Was it worth it in terms of measuring it versus outcomes? And what is what is the response to that? Because all the Da Vinci equipment is beautiful, wonderful. Terrific technology, but it costs a million and a half plus the tools cost mm -hmm. a lot of money. So each hospital that buys it has to have a, a higher charge for that kind of surgery. But how do you guys defend that? What is your vision? Where do you think this is going to go in, in the healthcare system? Well, um, just initially about the press, they want a story. <laughs> and so um, there, there will be a story no matter what. Um, what, what we've seen in various different countries around the world is that every country and every healthcare system evaluates cost and effectiveness in a different way. And so in the United States, um, it costs about a million and a half to two million, depending on how many bells and whistles you want. If you're using, and then there's instruments and accessories and things like that, it brings about $2,000 extra per case in terms of bringing this technology in. But the patients are going home on average two and a half days earlier. And at a tertiary care center, it costs about $1,500 per day to keep that patient in the hospital. 
And so even in the length of stay, we are seeing the cost being offset. The payers do not pay any more. They pay exactly the same amount, whether someone gets a prostatectomy that's open or a prostatectomy that is done with a robot or laparoscopically. And so it's the hospitals that are left holding the bag on that difference in cost if it's actually costing them more. And what we're seeing is that hospitals are buying three, four, five robots, and they're not making up in volume what they're losing on each one of these cases. It's working out for them economically. When you look at places like Sweden and sort of the northern, um, the, the Nordic countries, their healthcare system is much, much more complete than ours here. They actually pay for people's time off work. And so they did a study where they were looking at not just the acute hospitalization, how much does it cost me inside the operating room? What I was talking about is operating room plus the hospitalization and being able to draw your circle around that. They said, how long does it take for the person to go home? And they found that people went home after seven weeks with open surgery, I mean, went back to work after seven weeks with open surgery and went back after 11 days with minimally invasive surgery. And we see the highest number of robots per capita of any country in the world in these northern European countries where they actually are paying for the entire uh, person. So yes, there will always be a story, but the individual hospitals are making their economic decisions based on their cash flow and they're buying robots. I think there's another dimension, which is, um, and maybe this is a bigger uh, a picture view, is that our, uh, uh, our country and our society uh, has always uh, been a leader in innovation, uh, whether it's in these devices or uh, and just healthcare in general. And, uh, in, in, you know, the devices developed by this uh, company are just one example, but robotic technology is moving fast and, and, and far. And there are going to be lots of other examples and, and things learned uh, from this uh, from this device that are going to inform the next generation and the next generation. And they're probably already being worked on, which are much simpler. And maybe it won't even require, and as a surgeon, I hate to say this, but a surgeon, yes. you know, doing that, that may, uh, uh, you know, in some ways uh, de decrease, the, uh, uh, decrease the cost. Uh, and this is happening in our academic medical centers all across the country where people are uh, uh, researching these things. They're using simulation linked to it, uh, virtual uh, uh, reality that gets linked into it, uh, 3D printing. You can just see uh, where, where this is headed. So, um, you know, we're in the early phase of this. So, uh, you know, if it's, if it's commercially successful, that's great. But it's still, uh, there's all these other research and innovation dimensions to it. All right, please, uh, like I said. I just, I don't know what phototherapy is. Oh, So I sure. wanted to I'm ask you to about that. It's Thank not you. a tanning salon. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little bit like what it sounds. It's light, photo, and then therapy. And so um, babies with severe jaundice, what that actually is, is hyperbilirubinemia. And it's a buildup in the blood of bilirubin. And um, the baby's liver can't quite process it. And if it builds up too too much in the brain, it can cause brain damage or even death. Um, so when you have severe jaundice, it's time sensitive. And what we see in low income countries is they don't have good screening. You have moms who give birth at home and very often it's jaundice. So about, um, actually how many parents in the room? I bet there's a lot. Okay, how many of you had kids with jaundice? Yeah, so it's about 60% of all um, babies have jaundice. And how many of you had babies who were treated with jaundice? So it's about 12% in the U.S. It's 17% um, in low-income countries because of lack of pre prenatal care. Um, and we literally, and some of you hear, oh, you can put your baby out in the sun. Well, yes, but there's also UV in only 12 hours a day. And a baby needs about two to three days of uninterrupted care. So we've actually been in hospitals, for example, and you've gone in other places where they're, they're setting the babies out in the sun, and the nurses hate it because they, they lose the children and there's other other things too. So um, we don't think about it here. Pardon? Yes, children, children die. die not so you have, um, in terms of brain damage, yeah, sorry. In terms of brain damage, it can cause, <laughs> you lose them, yes, fully. Um, but the brain damage is, 
most severely cerebral palsy and deafness. So. Great. So I'm going to um, ask one final question to our panelists. But before I do, um, Krista and Catherine are in a panel together directly after this. So if you want to continue this conversation, follow them. We'll talk about new things. Um, <laughs> and if anyone is interested in actually learning how to apply a bit of this human-centered design process, we have two um, labs that I'm leading um, with a few others um, today at 3.45 and tomorrow at 3.45. So um, come out to the Mabel tent um, and join us for that if you want to sort of learn what it actually looks like to do a little bit of this human-centered design approach. Um, but before we close, I wanted to ask you if um, you had sort of one last point to leave our audience with related to products that enrich lives. Kurt, do you want to start? Well, um, I think maybe uh, uh, Chris said it uh, best is, is uh, to think about the impact and think about the, uh, the possibilities and uh, make sure you're aligned with uh, uh, your vision of what you're trying to do with uh, whether it's your company uh, or your practice or in our case uh, a health system for kids uh, to be sure that you're not um, that you're staying true to those values and that you uh, and continuously uh, check in with that. Yeah I, I, I would second that work on the important problems and use, use the solution of that problem as your litmus test of deciding whether you're going to be doing something or not. Will this improve patient outcomes is my litmus test. Is there a path for it to improve patient outcomes? If yes, we'll add it to the stuff we're working on. If not, it was just interesting to learn about. So in my case, uh, myself, including another techies, basically, they have big ideas. Like they think they have big ideas, and this, they fall in love with the big idea. So uh, my whole thing, my point would be that uh, rather than, big ideas are not big, they're just ideas, they become big in hindsight when, <laughs> when there are enough users. So uh, focus on the problem, forget the big idea, a little bit like that. I'll, I'll add, yeah, stay focused on the impact and I think the thing that we've really learned is understanding who all the users and stakeholders are along the way and making sure the incentives are there because lesson learned for us, for example, is if you have a salesperson who's not making as much money selling your devices like another device, it doesn't work. So really look at the incentives of everyone that you need to get to impact from idea. Great. So thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at Level Seven. Thanks, Justin. Don't yeah. forget the YouTube. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, so 16 countries, 20,000 babies. It's been on the market about a year and a half. We're really, we're really happy. Yeah. Yeah. So we're actually, we're applying for a big grant right now to deepen penetration in the, the low, low income hospitals. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi.